old, incapable, and heartsick I may be, the moment I recall your face, my youth restored to me. The first lines of a new collection titled Faces of Love of the Work of Hafez, the medieval Persian considered one of history's greatest lyric poets. Translator Dick Davis is a leading scholar of Persian literature and himself a poet. Faces of Love is the latest in an extraordinary undertaking by Davis of translating many of the masterworks of Persian civilization, including most recently Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, the Persian Book of Kings. And welcome to you. Thank you. I want to set the scene mm -hmm. a little bit. 14th century Persia mm -hmm. in the city of Shiraz that you compare in your introduction to, to Venice. Yes, uh, it was a trading city. Um, it was the center of a very flourishing aristocratic situ uh, civilization. Because it was a trading city, it had a very uh, wealthy uh, uh, upper class, as it were. And this upper class was able to provide the money for a lot of artistic pat patronage. And so there were a great many poets in, in Shiraz uh, during the 14th century and in the previous century as well, the 13th century. And the greatest of them came to be Hafez. Now tell us about who, wa who was he? What do we know? Hafez was a poet uh, who was at the court uh, which ruled Shiraz at the time. He was one of the court poets. Um, he's a poet who, he's a bit like Bach. People say that Bach sort of gathered together everything that, that had gone before him in music mm -hmm. and brought it into, into a, a new kind of um, stage. Hafez did the same with the conventions of lyric poetry. And so the, the lyric poem is seen to reach its, its highest point in Hafez. One of the great things about Hafez's poetry is that it's extremely ambiguous often and that it can be read in different ways. And his poetry can be read in a secular way or in a religious way. Uh -huh. uh, and this has meant that he has become sort of all things to all people who are interested in Persian poetry. But of course, there's love, there's enjoyment of life, there's mm -hmm. a lot of drinking, the wine flows. Th th now, there's there's men mentions of the heart and of course, there's sorrow and loss. There's a great deal of sorrow and loss, mm -hmm. true. Yes, true. And wine is the, is the, the thing that uh, makes you forget the sorrow and loss. So if there are many uh, ways of reading it and you're the translator, you have to, you have to figure out how to put that into, into a language we can understand. That's the great problem with translating half mm -hmm. that you have this constant ambiguity and ambiguity is very difficult to transfer from one language mm -hmm. to another. It's also, uh, and, and you make clear in the introduction, uh, and it comes through in some of the themes in the poems, mm -hmm. some analogies to our own contemporary life, right? There's points in, in Shiraz when the city gets taken over by uh, uh, um, a fundamentalist ruler yes. who bans drinking yes, and, exactly. and, and art is sort of swept away. That's true. I mean, yeah. um, music is forbidden. Uh, drinking wine is forbidden. Uh, there's a kind of clamp down on the sexual morality of the place. It becomes a very austere, what we might call a Puritan place. So that's, that's obviously a, not quite the right word for this culture. But it's, it, it becomes a place where any kind of uh, physical pleasure is taboo has to be avoided. And Hafez has a lot of poems about how dreadful this is. Uh, and then when this ruler is uh, swept away, in fact by his own son, uh, there are, are poems which uh, welcome this change when pleasure is allowed back into the life of the city. I think many people in our audience who would know Persian poetry, they mm -hmm. think of the most famous as Rumi. Yes. And yet, I understand that Hafez is in, in Iran itself mm -hmm. is by far the most famous and popular still to this day. That's true. Why, why is that? What explains his appeal today? Well, I, I th one of the reasons I think is, is, is what I said. It's about that Hafez's poems are very ambiguous. And they, not all of them, but many of them. And they can be read in many different ways. Uh, another reason that Hafez is so popular, I think, is that he speaks to almost all the possibilities of one's emotional and intellectual life too. Whereas Rumi speaks to one side of life, mm -hmm. very emphatically, very strongly, very persuasively, uh, and he has, a, he has his own very strong following. And what role does he play in contemporary uh, Iran? I mean, the, these are lines that are memorized by, by people, used all the time? Oh, he's absolutely canonic. I mean, he's, he's like... Shakespeare and Milton and Wordsworth and Tennyson rolled into one. Really? Yeah, he's, he is the major great poet. Uh -huh. uh, and almost everybody who has any pretensions to an interest in poetry at all, which is most of the population in Iran, it's a very poetry-loving culture. Well, but, but, but see, explain that, because that is not the Iran that we usually talk about on a program like this, that right? That is true. I'm aware of that. But, yeah. uh, but po 
different cultures seem to put, they put their energies into different arts at different times. In the medieval period, I mean, for example, you can think of painting in Italy or music in Germany, that kind of thing. But in the medieval period, the artistic energies of Iran went largely into poetry. Mm -hmm. And poetry has become part of the Persian cultural identity in a way that's true of very few other cultures. Even English culture, which mm -hmm. prides itself on its poetry so much, poetry is not so, so central to the identity as it is in Iran. There are very few literate Iranians who can't quote off by heart poems or at least many lines of Hafez to you. I mentioned in the introduction that this is one of a number that you're doing. Is, mm -hmm. I mean, is, is, it sort of feels like a mission that you're on. Is that a right way to do it? And, and if so, what is it that you're trying to convey, especially to a Western audience? Well, I, I, I went to Iran in my 20s, and I, I went for two years, but I finished up staying for eight years, and then and I married, my wife is Iranian, whilst I was there, and we had to leave Iran because of the, the Islamic Revolution and the place where I was teaching was closed down and so forth. When I got back to England, I realized that I had had this extraordinary privilege of, of getting to know, to some extent, this culture which is almost unknown in the West. I had begun to learn Persian seriously. I, when we came back to England, I, I, I did a PhD in, in medieval Persian. Uh, and I thought there is all this marvelous literature. And as you said at the beginning, I'm a poet myself. Uh, there's all this wonderful poetry, most of which is unknown in the mm -hmm. West. Or if it's known, it's known in very obscure scholarly translations that very few people read. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I have the opportunity to bring something of this culture, which I really fell in love with, utterly. Um, uh, I had this opportunity to bring it over to a Western audience, and so that's what I've done with the past 30 years of my life, really. And I'm very happy to have done it. It's been a, a wonderful sort of odyssey, going from poet to poet. <clears throat> All right. Well, the latest collection is Faces of Love. Dick Davis, thanks so much. Thank you.